Could the mental state of dissatisfaction as a seemingly default human condition have been a main driving force in our progress over time? Could the constant feeling of things should be better, things should or could be better, have caused behavioral and intellectual explorer modes into being? As a follow-up, could the fact that many people live in an almost magically safe and comfortable paradise relative to all of our ancestors, yet experience chronic anxiety despite that fact, be a maladaptive aspect of this? And so that's an excellent question. And then um, Gary said, oh my God, that's almost exactly the question I was going to ask. Um, maybe add this to it and let's get to these two together. Can you teach us more about a riff on your explorer mode concepts, in particular how it applies to humans? Uh, maybe thinking about are humans unique in our extreme propensity for explorer mode activity? What is the opposite? Is it nesting mode? What are the main triggers of explorer mode in humans? Could opponent process or conflicts between explorer mode and whatever the other modes are be at the root of a lot of human suffering, the human condition? And does the most excessive explorer mode propensity align with progressivism and a lack of it with conservatism? And yes, that's a lot of questions, but they're yeah, all but good. Yeah, but you also answered most of them <laughs> in the question asking. Okay. Um, so, yes, and uh, I'm not sure if this is in the book, but... Yes to the original question of could the mental state of dissatisfaction as a seemingly default human condition be a main driving force in our progress? This is 100%. Is, that's, that, that's, that's the it. question you're answering yeah. yes. yes. That is 100%. It, yep. right? The idea is yep. a satisfied creature is an unmotivated creature who does not find opportunity where it exists. Now, mm -hmm. the second Or find question, sufficient, doesn't find new opportunity where it exists. Well, I, I think that's, that is encompassed in opportunity. If the opportunity exists and you're missing it, then that's, a, that's an error. So satisfaction that results in not seeing opportunity is bad and we could go into multiple reasons why it's bad but yes that's why you should be dissatisfied by default that is why happiness is a temporary state it is attainable as a reward for correctly searching and finding opportunity but it is not stabilizable because if you became satisfied you'd miss the next opportunity this is a close uh, kin to the point that we make about uh, the metaphor when uh, literally false metaphorically true everything happens for a reason right if you say to somebody who's just lost a loved one that everything happens for a reason right that is wrong your loved one may have died for no reason however if you are in the mindset that however terrible what has just happened is that something positive must be traveling in tandem with it you will not be so absorbed by your grief that you miss the opportunity and an opportunity is probably disproportionately likely at that moment because the loss of somebody just simply shuffles the deck right the number of things that may cascade out of just the simple change of their presence in your community means that there may be opportunities and you as much as you need to grapple with the death you don't want to miss the opportunities that happen to coincide in time with it. So dissatisfaction is a useful default state. And it, do, it is linked maybe slightly loosely with the concept of explorer modes. Explorer modes being a matter of increasing the likelihood of finding opportunity beyond random search. Right. In other words, what the what the biology textbook says is mutations happen. They're almost all bad. Occasionally, there's a good one. When there's a good one, it may be collected by selection because it provides us a little advantage. Right. Yeah. That is a terrible way to discover new genes that are more effective than the versions you had beforehand. Terrible. Right. It is so haphazard, and it is impossible that selection would have missed. The fact that there are ways of increasing your hit rate right in other words oh my god i've lost my keys right where shall i look well let's take out a <coughs> map of the 50 states which states have you looked in yet well i haven't left this state in six months and i saw my keys this morning maybe i can rule out every other state and just search the one i live in right that is heuristics it, evolve right heuristics evolve they have to right, right. if they don't 
then the people who claim explorer modes don't exist have to explain how evolution could possibly build an eye and miss the fact that there are a million ways to increase your likelihood of finding something useful above a random search, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the basic argument. Now, in humans, this can let me look. First of all, humans are two different things. Humans are a hardware robot platform with a physiology like every other creature. Not as, you know, special in a few ways, but not many. Mostly we're just like other creatures. How does selection search for ways to improve our morphology and physiology as it does with all the other mammals? Yes, there are explorer modes. I do think I know what they are and they haven't been spotted yet, but a story for another day. I think it's a really interesting question and the answer is staring us in the face, but we just are standing in the wrong place to see it. But the place where humans are special is how we search um, space for alterations of our behavior, right? And what I think we can say is that creativity and the mode in which we imagine what might be, right? If you're, if you're an engineer and you're trying to solve a problem and you build an object in your mind to see whether or not a solution could be generated of the following form, right? You build it and you run it and then you realize, oh, that's not going to work because if you do this, then it undoes that and you refine it, right? That process is an explorer mode. What it means is how many, how much materials do you need? How, how much time do you need to prototype your way to a solution to a problem? Well, vastly less if you can test ideas in your mind and not have to build the prototype because you already know why it's going to fail. And you only mm -hmm. have to build the ones you don't know what's wrong with them yet, right? So that greatly increases the rate at which you come to a solution. And notice how built in it is, right? We humans have this weird, I mean, it's exactly as, as both question askers here hint at. We have this weird obsession with solving problems. And that makes total sense when the problems are big. But it's just odd. I mean, we all do it, right? The little annoyances in our life where the, the very thing we need doesn't exist. And so there are three steps to doing the thing we're doing rather than one. And you think, well, why isn't there an object that just blah, right? That obsession with, well, how could I make my life that much more efficient is really a... And so the cherry pitter was born. <laughs> right, <laughs> Exactly, the cherry pitter, <laughs> All the, the apple ridiculous slicer. little objects that you accumulate, like that are highly specialized. The and that highly specialized. Did solve a problem, but unless you are actually trying to solve that problem multiple times a week, just as a guess, you probably don't want it in your life. Right, but yes. the funny thing is. Mm -hmm. This was all much closer to a matter of life and death yes. when we were stressed for calories. Because the point is, little increases in efficiency, being a little more averse to being in the cold so that you seek out layers to wear or places to sit. Well, or... and, I, and I said that as a joke, but you know, we're looking out on snowberries. And I don't know actually what eats snowberries. I'm, I'm, I want to guess birds, although they're the wrong color. I so it's I... Yeti. <sighs> oh, my God. <laughs> Too early? I mean, not Yeti? Oh, God. Oh, God. This has gotten worse um, rapidly. Encore. Um, like the the they're round with round seeds and it it's going to take a lot of work to get the calories off of them if you're not in the if you're not a, a seedivore which most things aren't uh so you know developing the tool that actually allows you to get the flesh off of either plant or animal that you're eating more quickly is is huge and you know and and the 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 bigger more obvious one uh, which has been proposed by Richard Rango, among other people, and which we talk about in the book, is, well, fire. Fire allows you to get, cooking your food, and your meat in particular, allows you to get so many more nutrients out of the food and to take a lot less time masticating it, such that that was a huge improvement. And uh, there was, you know, many, hundreds of thousands, it's got to be more than that, but let me just be conservative here, hundreds of thousands of hominid hours spent sitting around chewing uncooked meat going, there must be a better way. There must There's be a better gotta way. There's got to be a better There's way. There's got to be a better way. Uh, and then lightning struck and there were charred corpses and someone tasted one and went, ah. Barbecue corn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, here's one. Okay. Um, the mango is one of the most delightful fruits on earth 
but for its physical form, which Dick Alexander actually hypothesized yeah. was uh, created by selection to make it impossible to efficiently deal with the seed so that a disperser would have to sort of carry it away as they were trying to get the meat off of the seed. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of ways to eat a mango. All of them are wrong except one, as far as I'm concerned. There is... Well, but we met we met that guy at Tipitini. We met that guy in the Amazon, a Colombian undergraduate, I think he was, um, who just ate it like an apple. <laughs> yeah, now that's bad because... for him? I can't remember his it name. It worked for him, but, but the fact is that name. is actually bad because mangoes are in the... Uh, the poison Solanaceae. ivy family, Solanaceae, Solanaceae which yeah. is a very poisonous family of plants. Yeah. The sap is very uh, caustic, and the skin of a mango uh, actually uh, has irritants in it that can cause you to develop a mango allergy, which, while it's not as bad as having cancer, is really bad because it means you can't eat mango. So you don't want to contact the contents of the skin more than necessary. Uh, but anyway, there's a way to open a mango, which involves slicing the two mango cheeks off it, mm -hmm. scoring them kind of like you're making in a, a slightly more elaborate uh, tic-tac-toe yeah. uh, yeah, grid, yeah. slicing them all the way down to the skin but not through it, and then flipping them open so that basically you have a grid of mango chunks, which you can then eat, and it's not completely mess free but it's close right and it's then trimming. you got to get the bit around the rim but somebody figured out you know that mango is a delightful fruit it's really hard to eat um but they you know they cut the gordian knot on it and yeah. then once you've the, seen the it the knife wasn't had to have been invented first though yes yeah the inside of mango skin makes my face rash and it does that's the solanaceae thing that's the poison yep. ivy family thing and so this way you don't have to end up exposed to um to the skin or only slightly only slightly yeah only slightly. i mean some people you eat too much mango at a time and you can produce this reaction in yourself and then it may be hard to eat mango ever again yes so. in fact <laughs> um the uh the term for it on uh, barrow colorado island where i did my work and where mangoes grew in the canal zone and actually if you had access to a boat which i did you could find these isolated trees that nobody was harvesting the mangoes from that just had you could get a bucket of the most delightful mangoes but anyway um those unfortunate souls who had the reaction to mango uh as were some understood. people in the chat do yes yeah. they uh had mango lips and it's your your lips become very uh hard and unpleasant feeling uh yeah. if you have eaten this they become swollen or whatever yeah. it is um so yeah yeah the 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 guy uh who we met who was doing research at tipitini when we were there in january 2020 uh was eating them skin and all yeah and we, we were just after most meals because you know we had shared common commodore and there were only i don't know eight of us there at the time or yeah. something at the field station um we just watched we'd watch him go through two or three of these be like how are you still upright yeah like, how is your face not puffy I was and say may he rest in peace <laughs> no he, he actually he, I've, I've forgotten what his name was and i think he contacted us at some point after we started doing dark horse and i it's disappeared so if somehow you end up seeing this make contact again um anyway oh allergic to bananas mango and mangoes and latex but not to don't react to poison ivy really yeah interesting so your salad possibilities are broader than normal but your fruit possibilities are decidedly limited oh my god oh, that's terrible it's terrible <laughs> it's terrible okay uh well i don't remember how we went got to mango from we were talking about ways. explorer modes and yeah. dissatisfaction oh, yes. and just the idea that somebody was annoyed enough at the um yes poor uh what is the term the poor form factor of the mango <laughs> that they innovated a mechanism for dealing with it. Yeah. And that is the kind of thing that human beings do all the time. And yes, yeah. I, I don't know if we'd make the argument in Hunter Gatherer's Guide. I think we do. But this is exactly the basis of um, liberalism and conservatism. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I always say I won't, I'm a liberal who wants to live in a world so good that I get to be a conservative. This is exactly that thing, right? The point is at the point you have just solved the problem, the last thing you want to do is keep 
solving the same problem, mm -hmm. right? If you've just stumbled into the valley that is perfectly capable of uh, feeding a thousand of your kind and it has no competitors in it, right? You don't want to keep moving. You want yeah. to fill that niche. And so basically we are in a weird battle in modern times over whether or not we are in the place that should get us to stop moving or whether we are in the place from which we must move. Um, and this is a liberal versus conservative battle. And they, you know, we are watching liberals propose effective, effectively utopias to which we cannot go as replacements for a system that is flawed but highly functional. And conservatives uh, are not recognizing the reasons that it is not a permanent state of being from which we should never leave. And that is just resulting in a completely incoherent uh, dialogue. The fact is, we can't stay here, but there's an awful lot right about this that we would be crazy to give up. And uh, I don't know, I hope we do end up having that conversation at some point. Hey guys, that was a clip from our monthly private Q&A that you can get access to at my Heather Hyang's Patreon. And you can also get access there to all of the past paid subscriber content. So please consider joining us there. Did you mention that these private Q&As are the key to living a better life and living to tell the tale? I forgot to do that. These private Q&As are in fact the key to living a better life and what? Living to tell the tale. Living to tell the tale. Go ahead, live to tell the tale. Join us there. See ya.